Oh, we're being recorded. Good, 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 good. Sorry, I should have done that when I said all those things about you, but. No, no, I'm, I'm, I prefer this. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna go straight to sharing my screen uh, so that I have at least some, some uh, toehold uh, in our talk today. But thank you, thank you all for, for uh, dropping in on this or inviting us uh, to drop in on your thing. Um, let's see, I only wanna show you what I wanna show you and not what I don't wanna show you. That's how this works. So we're going to go here and we're going to go here. All right, got that? Um, OK, well, thank you. Uh, and I feel compelled to acknowledge the significance, obviously, of being here on September 11th, uh, 19 years after 9-11. Um, that moment not only marks the, uh, the origins of DHS, which we've been uh, spending a lot of time uh, uh, looking into, but in some ways, the whole, this whole project. Um, so thanks, Assistant Dean Jen and uh, Dean Bob for asking us to come here. Um, we want to talk about uh, the book project, but also the projects that are associated with the book, including uh, uh, a larger uh, documentary project uh, specifically that we want to uh, uh, solicit your help with and uh, fiction work that Ed does and, and exhibitions that I do. Um, so we're going to talk for half an hour or so and then take your questions. Yeah, and we're, and we're really looking forward to your questions and, and we're, we're looking forward to talking more about the sort of three parts of our project so far. The, the book that Danny mentioned, some sort of museum exhibition, and also a, a web presence. And so it'll give, give you a sense, what, we hope to give you a sense of what we've done so far, what we're going to do, and then, and then we're going to really look forward to talking more about how we might collaborate with all of you. Uh, this quote up here on the screen now is by the is by Studs Terkel, and he's one of several inspirations for our project. Uh, we're basically working in the tradition of classic collaborative documentary practice and oral history. And the title of our, our book that you could see on the first slide uh, it, is a direct reference to Studs Terkel's groundbreaking book from 1972. It was called Working, and it was uh, subtitled, People Talk About What They Do All Day and How They Feel About What They Do. So we, we sort of apply that directly to uh, the, the security realm and our, our subtitle, our working subtitle is security workers talk about the parts of their jobs they can talk about and how they feel about the parts they can't talk about. Uh, we're, we're trying to create a composite portrait of a vital growth industry or as Dean Griffin uh, put it once in a conversation with us, it, it's sort of like a, uh, a longitudinal study of the homeland security world. And we're, we're trying to get at that portrait. We're trying to get at that study by talking to people and, and letting them tell us what it's like to work their job. Uh, as you'll see as we go along, we're not interested in classified information, uh, but rather in how people live their lives and hold so much secret. We're interested in how people manage to be parents and children and spouses while working in the security realm. Uh, so what we want to move to now is just a story of, we mentioned 9-11 and, and the, the origins of this project to some extent, but in, in some ways that the origins of our project go back further than that. Uh, both Danny and I have fathers who in some ways worked in the security realm. Uh, very differently, but in, in some ways it remained mysterious to both of us, I think. This is a picture of my father. It's, it's appropriately blurry, it, it seems to me. I mean, the, the father I grew up with was someone who was a textile salesman who, who sold uh, fabric from the people who made the fabric to the people who made the clothes. He was sort of a middleman. But occasionally he would tell stories of time in the Air Force Reserves when he was in Lebanon or in Central America teaching hand-to-hand -hand combat or, or various things. And the, the stories would always change. So I grew up never really knowing exactly what he had done. Uh, and, and that has consequences, I think. Uh, and, and I don't think it's that unusual. I, I interviewed him for the project and he, he mentioned how all his records had been uh, destroyed in some mysterious fire in St. Louis that only got the files from N to Z. So that's the kind of <laughs> detail he would give in these stories, but uh, you, you could never really back it up. So it, 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 it encouraged me to explore uh, the security realm in a way to to find my own path. And I, I wound up working for a while as a, a TSO at Albany International, 
back in 2012. I mean, that was, that was part midlife crisis, part trying to figure out what this connection to the security realm might mean to me and my family. Uh, I've written about it in a nonfiction way. Here's the, the sort of picture from the, the Guardian piece. It was a long essay, a, a, a nonfiction essay about working for the TSA. And then as uh, Assistant Dean Jen mentioned, I got, uh, I got a novel coming out in just a few weeks. Uh, it, 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 that's the cover. That's a, a portrait that Danny took of me when I still had access to my TSA uniform. I still have the vest uh, and the tag, and the <laughs> but the, the blue shirt I no longer possess. Uh, and you might have seen that the, 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 a piece of the novel was excerpted recently in the Times Union. That was, it was great to see it uh, get that kind of look here in the capital region. Uh, so that, that's one part of the origin story uh, of how we got going my, on my side, my father. Uh, do I understand my father any better after all this research and writing? Uh, I still don't know what he did, you know? Uh, but I am gaining uh, a greater sense of compassion and understanding for, you know, what shaped him and the person he's become. And then my dad, uh, I never knew what he did really uh, when he was doing it. And uh, we've had many, many conversations uh, uh, recently. And in fact, he was interviewed for this project. But uh, what you're looking at on the left there is a 2018 photograph that I made uh, of a prototype night vision system that my dad worked on uh, as the manager of several black programs at the time for the uh, defense contractor, Texas Instruments. Um, Included in there is a 78 OV-10 turret with a 1974 tow night sight and uh, pilot's display. Um, when he was working in 1965, the year I was born, on the first FLIR, the uh, forward-looking infrared, um, which they called man portable at the time, thermal imager, state-of-the-art, uh, uh, top secret. Um, at TI, that was known as old number one. He didn't know at the time that his client was the CIA. And so, of course, he also didn't know that the CIA was already in Vietnam uh, and needed to see in the dark. On the right there is his uh, special access required ID card from 1984, the year I graduated high school. Uh, that's from the Tonopah test range in the Nevada desert, where he worked on the black program that then became known a few years later as the Lockheed F-117, the Nighthawk stealth fighter. And we only learned that he was involved in that program and not just involved in it, but managed it when he casually mentioned it uh, during the 91 Gulf War that, oh yeah, yeah, we did those. Um, there's the 74 cutaway view uh, of the tow night site. Um, and, and I'll return to this uh, uh, mode of, of making photographs a little later, but I just wanted to show you what these really are. This is the set in my studio in Del Mar where the photographs are made, um, they're obviously flat things. They're prints made from the slides that the uh, the original TI photographer uh, made of these prototype devices to sell the programs to the military and intelligence clients um, to score a contract. Uh, Pre-PowerPoint, but nonetheless, they were giving uh, slide presentations, not unlike this one. And there's the guy. That's my dad. Uh, this is my dad photographed immediately after his interview for this project. And this is um, at least formally what these portraits, all of them look like. There's a couple dozen of these so far, of these folks that we've interviewed. And the way it typically goes is we spend time talking to them and then make the photograph. Um, so they've already kind of unloaded their stories on us and, and, and responded to our questions. And then they sit for uh, a portrait in the location of their choosing. Uh, and you notice that the uh, faces are in focus, the backgrounds are kind of radically blurred. That's to kind of isolate the individual from, from uh, a context and, and really kind of zoom in on them. This woman uh, currently works in DC as a program manager for projects across uh, safety, security, resilience, as they say, uh, for a private security firm and is an alum of CEAC. This was at uh, National Cathedral in DC where we also uh, interviewed and photographed this guy, retired U.S. Army commander and currently a PhD candidate. At, at George Mason, not at New Albany. At George Mason, sorry, <laughs> right, right on. Just to be straight. Not an alum, yeah. And this is the ever-present digital uh, recorder. What were you gonna say, Ed? Go ahead. 
Um, th the reason I include this slide is that uh, it, it reminds me how uh, struck we were initially by how little regard most of our subjects paid to the fact that the conversations were being recorded. Nobody ever said uh, what we expected was, you know, like, oh, well, I can't talk about that or I'd violate my clearance. Um, the, these were pros um, and we think they mostly told us the truth. Yes. And we weren't, we were never trying to have any kind of gotcha moments in these interviews. We were not interested in, as I said, in getting classified information. We were interested in what, what their, what the shapes of their lives were, what their family life was like, how they made the, the choices they made in terms of their career. So we, we had this standard list of questions that we asked everybody and we got it improved by IRP for human subjects. Uh, and, and, and the interviews would, would, would proceed r relatively orderly and, and people had a lot of freedom in terms of what they wanted to add, but we kept our questions consistent for, for each interview. And you can see in the next slide, uh, an example of how the interviews are laid out in, in the, the current version of the book, uh, which is it's, it's a book proposal that's been circulating to publishers right now. Uh, but you'll see that just as Danny was describing how the images are designed to highlight the individual, the interviews are designed the same way. So even though I'm asking questions during the interviews and I'm present for the whole interview, uh, the interviews themselves when they're on the page are just the words spoken by the person we're talking to. It's, it's edited and, and organized so that it only has the words of the people uh, that we're talking to. My questions are edited out anything I might say is edited out. We're just using, we're highlighting the individual here as well in terms of you know, his or her language. Uh, and I guess the, the next thing is, is to show some of the places where we did the interviews. And, and Danny can walk us through those. Yeah, so uh, you know, it, it, maybe it's, it's uh, an esoteric point, but it's, it's one of those aesthetic things that, that's important to me. Um, you know, the portraits, uh, isolate and highlight the individual. Uh, the environments uh, are free of people. They're not. They're not populated. They're just where we were. This is obviously uh, Arlington Memorial, where uh, one fellow wanted to be uh, interviewed. Um, and that's the other thing. We we let them choose the site of their photograph. We also let them choose the site of their of their interviews. Uh, this is National Harbor, where we interviewed a uh, security specialist with twenty odd years of special operations expertise in Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, Naval, uh, as well as DHS and the Coast Guard. Uh, and there's a little segue here that may be a confusing jump, but Ed's gonna help me explain. Um, uh, one fellow we interviewed uh, decided after talking to us that he trusted us and wanted to tell us more. Um, so made a second trip. And at, uh, at that time he decided that uh, he didn't want me to make his portrait. He wanted me to shoot with him which is not something that comes up very often uh, when I'm making people's photographs. Um, and then uh, I got home and started thinking about that uh, encounter. And uh, one of the questions he asked me is ever shoot suppress? And I was like, that doesn't also doesn't come up very often in my job. Um, and so I recreated one of the personal effects from that encounter. And that's something that I do a lot in this, uh, not in the book project, but in the larger project of my own creative output is uh, I make models and I make photographs of the models. So this is a model of his uh, uh, 45 caliber Glock suppressed uh, on a, uh, an invisible tabletop. Invisible because it's the, uh, the ubiquitous uh, gray checkerboard of Photoshop when you cut away everything, except that I hand drew it because I hate myself. Um, and this is a recreation of the same fellow's uh, twin Rolexes. He wears one on both wrists. Um, Ed, you're good at telling that story. Well, I mean, it, it's indicative or it's an example of, of sometimes when we do these interviews, uh, it gives people a chance to unburden themselves of some of the stories they've been carrying or, or, to, or to repeat some of the stories, which they probably repeat all the time in order to live with them. And one of the stories we heard was about someone who was in a, a, a terrible firefight uh, and, and wound up, you know, just, just deeply wounded and, and also wound up next to a, a comrade who had fallen and, and, and was, was, had, had died. Uh, and one way he remembers the comrade is by wearing the watch, which no longer ticks. And then also he wears a second watch, which continues to tick. And, and that 
it was it was it was uh, an honor and it was haunting to hear the story and, and it's it's an honor to hear so much of what we hear during these interviews uh, and some of it sticks with us in ways that we we can't necessarily control and one way to process it is to bring it into our creative practice and I think that's what Danny did here yeah. uh, with this image uh, and this fellow doesn't realize that, that this was also a kind of homage to a very well-known uh, work of art by the artist Felix Gonzalez Torres called Twin Lovers, uh, which was two battery-powered synchronized clocks that eventually drift out of synchronization. Um, and there's a sort of like poetic resonance between this and this fellow's story of his comrade. Yeah, and, and part of what this also captures is the way in which, you know, we're, we're doing the book project. It has a, a pretty clear... Uh, structure and it's pretty straightforward, uh, but we but other projects continue to grow out of that original project. So the the novel, in a way, is is an example of the same kind of creative practice. It's it's a work of fiction that grew out of my experience working in the security realm, uh, as brief as that experience was, and and we continue to to kind of marvel at the ways in which what we're doing in one project affects the work we do in our own creative practices. Uh, so when we, when we talk about this project as something that's continuing, and not only is it continuing in ways we've planned, but it also evolves in ways uh, that, that continue to surprise us. For sure, and we don't really have a recipe or a template. <laughs> we're, uh, we're kind of uh, uh, pulling the thread on the sweater and uh, as it completely unravels. All right, so these, the images that Dan's about to show you might seem like, might seem a little puzzling, uh, or to use his word, weird. Uh, but <laughs> they, you know, we're still asking ourselves the question of how do these pieces all connect? And we're, we're really curious to hear how you're processing some of this, even in this brief overview of what we're doing. So, so yeah, not to get too, too, you know, far down the rabbit hole of, of you know, my neuroses, but uh, one of the things I do in my work is uh, uh, translations and translations with uh, uh, missing bits of information. So it's a, it's a kind of like real time interpolation. Uh, so this is a tarmac at Reagan International. And this represents a place where, that we spent some time that I was unable to get photographs. And so in a lot of cases, I, I recreate clumsily recreate uh, the spaces where we were not able to make photographs uh, using Google Earth ground view, I go and, and plunge in the coordinates and, and then uh, position myself virtually on the ground and then take hundreds of screenshots uh, and then make dozens of prints, physical prints, and then make a cardboard model. So you're looking at a, a studio photograph of a cardboard model of a Google Earth uh, uh, series of prints. This is a, a, a tabletop model, a photograph of a tabletop model of the Blackwall Hitch in Arlington, Virginia, a restaurant and pub where we met numerous times with folks to sort of lay the groundwork for interviews. Too noisy to do actual interviews. Uh, it is rendered invisible um, in, in my kind of uh, uh, grammar of, of visibility uh, because it's not available on Google Earth for whatever reason. Um, which was delicious to me. This place that we went over and over that I never got a photograph of, I went to get uh, Google's photograph of it, and guess what? It doesn't exist. Um, so I built a model, because that's what I do. Uh, this is a 3D collage from Google uh, ground view of uh, Draper Hall on the downtown campus of UAlbany. This is a house in Dallas, Texas uh, that was the site of an interview. And this is the model in the studio that kind of gives you uh, Every time I show these, I think maybe it just uh, reveals uh, my psychological problems. But this is, <laughs> this is, this is what the models look like. Um, uh, they're not huge, they're not small, uh, and I use a 4 by 5 camera to make them. Can you go back to the image, Danny, just to show people? Like of course. That's the resulting photograph. It's a 4 by 5 foot photograph made from a 4 by 5 inch negative. Uh, and the the, the resulting print is actually larger than, slightly larger than the set in, in physical dimensions. So most of you, or some of you will recognize uh, uh, this site. This is not a model, except it is. It's kind of a, a, an interesting uh, paradox. This is the USAR simulator, Urban Search and Rescue Simulator at SPTC, the uh, State Preparedness Training Center in Ariskany. Uh, this is one of several images we made during a visit there last year. Um, 
I mean, there's so much about this place that is intriguing to me. Uh, not least of which is the fact that it's a real place, but it's not the real place that it uh, appears to be. It's not a set. It's not a, it's not a, it is a simulation, uh, but it's uh, a simulation where real training happens for the real world, unlike a Hollywood set, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is the outside of the cityscape sim uh, simulator, first in Maine. And this is my favorite image uh, in the series uh, currently, the Roster Field Motel. Um, standing before the print uh, of this image, um, there's a there's a kind of ridiculous level of description that a four by five inch view camera affords, um, and it's uh, it's over described uh, given the conspicuous lack of description in the real space <laughs> when you stand there. Um, if you were if you were in front of this print, you would be able to read what's on that bucket, and some of you who've been there would know that that bucket reads uh, "ammo boxes only." <laughs> so, what's next? What's next, Ed? What's next? Well, as we've said, I mean, there we we have a we have a book proposal that's circulating, and and we're optimistic and hopeful that it's going to find its way to a publisher, and that that book will contain. Uh, interviews and portraits and some of the, the straightforward objects, uh, but we're still working on putting together a proposal for a museum exhibition and then we're hoping to have a, a web presence where this, where this sort of archive, this, this composite portrait can continue to grow. Uh, the book is a bounded object, but what, we're, what we envision is something that's unbounded that can continue to expand as stories and images get added. Uh, but, you know, for, for the last years, you know, the, the people working on this project have been Danny and myself. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's, there's only so much we can do as two people. So we're, we're really hopeful on a number of levels uh, to find ways to collaborate and to continue our collaboration with uh, CEHC. Uh, we, we want to we want to involve graduate students and and help and get help with interviewing more people we want we want to just continue to expand what we're doing uh, we, we, we also have done teaching collaborations and we want to continue that work as well in, in any way we can uh, and those, those are just we, and we want to as uh, we heard from the introduction you know we're we were just about to write a grant we want to continue to work on 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 research and grants together uh, with 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 all of you. Uh, so we're, we're really interested to hear any questions you might have, any observations you'd care to share, or any ideas about how we might uh, continue to grow the collaboration. I just saw the chat, which was not visible, visible to me when I was uh, screen sharing. So that was some fast link work, work there. Thank you for that <laughs> Felix Gonzalez Torres uh, image. That's fantastic. So I did, I, that, that, at least from my perspective, that's what comes next, right? Uh, we, we continue to expand and, and uh, get help <laughs> because, the, I mean, the two of us will keep working, but uh, we can only do so much, just the two of us. Uh, and we're thing, also permanent outsiders, yeah. right? So we're, we're, we're uh, really only ever going to be translators um, and, and require the, the uh, collaboration and cooperation of insiders. Right. I mean, it's important that we, I'm mean, not that we really have a choice, but it's, it's really important that we remain outsiders because for us to, to help uh, share this, just these stories with people outside of the industry, I think it's important to have outsiders involved. And uh, just as Danny say, we can serve as, as translators in a way. So does that, How did yeah, you I, I'll, I'll kick off if I could, um, not, kickoff is probably the wrong word to use. Um, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. And, and also thank you for recognizing, recognizing the day. Um, it's for those of us that were involved, it's, um, it, it's permanently, it's permanently scarred us. Um, and, and candidly, it's permanently scarred our family, um, our families. You know, I was talking to my wife just a little bit earlier about, 
about the day uh, and, and, you know, her, her experiences and, and my experiences obviously were really different. Um, in some respects, it was harder on her than it was on me because I had something to do. She had to sit and fret. Um, I, I, I will, will support this in any way that I can. Um, it's, it's incredibly important that we collect this information and collect these stories. Uh, I was talking to my freshmen and 9-11 is like Pearl Harbor was to me. Um, it, it was something that happened in, in history and, and they, they, they read about it, but, but there, isn't, there isn't the connection back to it. Um, and, and making sure that we keep that connection alive and, and tell the stories of, of what happened afterwards and, and, and what happens with public service, I think is just really, really, really important. Um, and, and and my crazy mind, as I've said to you before, that, that, w that we put up a, a, a permanent display in ETEC that will, will honor, honor both the memories and, and the sacrifice and the continued sacrifice of people in the field because um, it's important for our students to see it and it's also important for us to start to incorporate um, our graduates and alumni as they get into these fields um, in, into the story of this family. Sure, um, yeah. So, no, thank so you thank, for that. Thank you. No, thank you. That's I mean, true. I think, you know, uh, uh, often when I'm trying to explain this to, to uh, either colleagues who are artists or, or people who are, are, you know, whatever the opposite of an artist is, um, it's like, so why, why, what's the point of the art part, right? I mean, I, I get the, the, the more straight documentarian uh, approach, but what's the part of the, of the art? And, you know, just this morning, I, I my Instagram feed is a, a cascade of uh, images of the Tribute in Light, right? Which was done by Paul Mayota and Julian Laverdier. Laverdier was one of my former students from Cooper Union when I taught there. And that, that ability to process uh, and share is, is obviously, just from talking with these folks, uh, you know, it's not something but, well, let's say it's something that's conspicuously absent from doing the job, right? You do the job, you do the job, and a lot of the ways you do the job is you don't stop all the time and think, what does this mean? How am, how am I processing this? And how, how, how are the people around me processing this? Because you can't at every moment, or you can't do the job, right? Mm So yeah, I, I love I love the idea of of, of a uh, a permanent uh, uh, exhibition, and that we might step out of it. I mean, that's one of the one of the goals of a sort of when we say larger project, we keep using that that term larger project. So the book happens, an exhibition happens, um, but a larger project is a sort of evolving thing that then might spiral out from this sort of uh, you know uh, Danny and Ed show. Yeah. Yeah, I see a question in the chat. Uh, uh, I was wondering if you asked your interview subjects about their take on the post 9-11 world in contrast to the period they served in the security field. That's a great question. Uh, that, that's, not a, that's, not, that's not one of the questions on our standard list, uh, but in, in a way it almost doesn't have to be because I, I, would, I, I can't say for certain, but I think if we go through every single interview we've done, it always comes up. It's, it's mm -hmm. always, even even for people who are on the youngest side, it's it's a crucial part of why they chose this profession, uh, and anybody who who was around for it and working for it inevitably mentions it. Uh, but it it it's a good question, and we're, we're always refining uh, the questions we ask. So th th this is a helpful idea. Yeah, Ed and I uh, 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 thought that we would do something. I don't know if it would be an op-ed or something uh, uh, where we talk to people about, uh, you know, the situation in Portland, uh, you know, the sort of evolving, uh, uh, I don't know how to characterize it, but the, uh, what's happening within DHS currently and, and people who started that job doing one thing, thinking they were doing one thing and then the job changes while they're in it and they still have to do the job and uh, and the sort of uh, uh, you know questioning that comes up, the sort of uh, uh, ontological, epistemological <laughs> you know core of why you know you're there uh, starts to shake underneath you. Um, what's that like? And newsflash: not everyone wants to talk to us. 
about that. <laughs> and and I, I mean, it, it sort of ties to our, what we were saying before about how we're fundamentally outsiders. I mean, when we were thinking about writing that piece, and I'm still thinking about it, uh, and that's, yeah. where that, that's why I, I grabbed the Studs Terkel quote uh, from that piece that I'm still working on, you know, the idea of breaking down walls and all the talk about walls of moms and walls of leaf blower dads, and yet no one was talking about the wall of guys in, and, and of, of men and women in camo on the other side and who's talking to them. And wouldn't it be great to be able to talk to people on both sides of the wall or who, who, who compose each wall. But, you know, we're not journalists. We're not, we, we can't, we can't like deploy ourselves quickly enough to Portland to talk to these people and write that story as much as I would, I think that's what needs to happen. I think the stories of all the people in Portland need to be told. And that would, you know, maybe I'm a, bright-eyed optimist, but that, that that exercise would de-escalate the situation. If you could hear from people as fathers and mothers and, and, and sons and daughters tell their stories of what they're doing out there, uh, the tension would go down. But you can't do that without being there, and we're not, we're not there right now. And so many people, when, when, when I would mention that, that we were considering doing this, uh, the initial reaction is, ooh, oh, yeah, are you sure? Now? You want to do that now? Really? <laughs> it's like, yeah, 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 we do. We better do it now because the, they're, a lot of them are passing. I mean, the, if, you, if you look at the death rate um, among the response, responders to 9-11, it's inordinately high. Right. You know, there, I was just thinking, to, I'm going to move the conversation a little different place, Danny, and it, um, there, there could be another, there could be a, a, a sort of companion to this as well. And um, uh, Sam Jackson is on and, and Sam does, I think, some amazing research into, into some of the, some of the, the sort of right wing groups. And it would be, it would be such a powerful um, view of the, of the faces of, of, of sort of that movement. And again, I'm not supporting that movement, mm -hmm. but just to, just to start to put a face behind a lot of the research and, and, and Sam, I don't know if you want to, I don't, I don't know if you want to talk, I mean, it, it, say a few words about what, what you've done, but um, it, it, it's, it's, we have to figure a way to start to humanize this. Yes. Find my unmute button. Um, I can say a few words. Um, so, this is a really interesting project, by the way, and I'm um, really fascinated by it. Um, there's a journalist named. Oh, good God! I'm going to forget his name. Now I have to look up his name because I can't not remember it. Um, he works for Reuters and he's, um, he takes pictures of a lot of right-wing activism um, and also some kind of random stuff like um, the Burning Man um, events. Um, and he takes really, really good photos, um, really powerful stuff. Um, of course, it's very different than what y'all are doing because he's a photojournalist. Um, and it's interesting because it does provide some of that humanization of some of the groups that I study. Um, I study uh, groups that are part of what I call the Patriot Militia Movement. So guys who like their guns and, and um, prepare to use it against whoever they see as the threat of the day, um, which has some interesting overlaps, of course, with Portland because they're out there saying that Antifa and BLM are um, violent threats that need to be suppressed and they're willing to do that if the government isn't. Um, but it, the, the pictures that this guy takes um, are, they're so almost bizarre because it's like guys who look like they're in the military, but they're in a mountain on, in Oregon, or they're walking in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri or something like that. And while it does humanize them, it also is so bizarre and so striking that in a certain sense, it um, kind of almost alienates you from them or, or you feel like it's like a movie or science fiction or something that just can't possibly be real to see these white men in quasi-military appearance in American streets. Um, and I imagine that the pictures that he takes do something 
almost the mirror image of what y'all are doing. Instead of doing that humanizing, it's kind of doing the reverse and alienating or otherizing people. I mean, I think that may be the cumulative effect of deploying folks in camo and, and you know, flak jackets and, and you know, bristling with, with, with ammo. Um, and that's, that's kind of been asserted, like, you know, this, this is urban crowd control. What, it's not camouflage. You're not camouflaged. You're actually conspicuously, you know, intimidating and, and appearing more militant. Well, you, you, are, you are anonymized. Yeah. Uh, as, as opposed to humanized. Yeah. yeah and I, I, I mean, you know, I, I just assume that that's an aesthetic decision <laughs> to, to advance an agenda. Um, but, but I assume that about a lot of things. <laughs> I um, came on late, but um, the aesthetic that you're talking about um, really is not, you know, does really go back. I remember, I think it was the, Democratic National Convention in Boston, would have that been maybe 2000 or 2004? Um, I remember um, walking in to the convention hall around fences that had been, chain link fences that had been created. And there were what I would think were soldiers all dressed in black with, you know, sort of machine guns or whatever, or I don't know what they were, I'm not an expert, slung over their shoulders. And it was very jarring, but at some level, it was also mildly reassuring, somewhat reassuring, um, you know, because, I, you know, this wasn't about a protest. It was, you know, then there were sort of rings of areas to enter showing your credentials. And, um, you know, it was security and it was the way they were doing it back then, which wasn't about protest at all but, you know, was whatever they were trained to do and to wear and to carry um, for what would have been a tier one, you know, event and, you know, something that was recognized to be a target. One, one of the other influences for this project, uh, and, it, and it's, it, I'm reminded of it in this conversation, is a, a book by Zone Books called Intimate Enemy. Uh, that was a documentary uh, account of the Rwandan genocide from the perspective of an equal number of uh, uh, perpetrators and victims. And the photographs in the uh, book um, don't identify who's a, who's a perpetrator or who's a victim. So it's just a bunch of faces and then the stories. And then you have to look up uh, in the index, whether they were a victim or a perpetrator of the violence. And so there's this initial uh, uh, kind of profound humanizing of, of everyone. In, and, and it's upsetting because as a reader, as a viewer, now you have to sort of keep your moral compass straight, right? Um, because you're dealing with all of these humans. Some of them did horrible, bad things, and some of them had horrible, bad things done to them. So uh, we're, we're not after that kind of ambiguity, but we are after that that there's something to that, that, uh, I don't know, that, that initial uh, uh, realization that like, yeah, these are people doing these things. These are people making these decisions. Um, and having to do the jobs and having to, to tell their kids, no, that wasn't me who beat up on that, that Navy SEAL. That was someone else. I promise. What am I missing from the chat? Jim Urquhart. Er Urquhart. Urquhart. I'm not familiar, but that doesn't mean much. Oh, thanks for that, George. What else? I saw there, there are, we, we have some volunteers to, to collaborate. That's excellent. Yes. That's excellent. And yeah, we do need more from uh, the intelligence community as it turns out, who would be willing to talk. So thank you. Thank you. And in terms of moving forward, I'm not, I'm not sure what yeah, the- Yeah, I think they would probably be able to
I'm sorry, sorry. Terry. Hi. Um, yeah, I said um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can probably get at least um, uh, four or five people to talk to from the IC. Um, we're on a, a, a number of um, large collaborative projects right now uh, within the Department of Defense, and um, we have uh, numerous people from a variety of um, agencies there, um, people with long histories, a um, number of former SESs and um, uh, uh, senior military leadership. Um, and, um, you know, just as you guys were talking, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I've, I've been doing this since 1988 and I never really thought what happened, you know, I always took it for granted that my family understood somehow. So it's very interesting because it kind of just rattled me just now as, and it didn't even correlate that with, yes, my daughter went into the IC then. And so I was like, what the heck happened here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she said, just figure out what mom was doing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so you, I've never really even thought about it from this angle. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is, a, this is rather disturbing. <laughs> so, yeah, Glad we could help. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, for shaking me up here, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, with my dad, it, yeah, you're you know, totally honestly, right. We're I think a lot of people have the experience of uh, th that I had, which is, at the time that my dad was was you know uh working on black programs he couldn't talk about it and then when it was over he didn't think anyone would care like it just wasn't it wasn't something that he thought we would care about yeah exactly i mean you're kind of like so, uh, yeah, it's just what you do you know and, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, my significant other came from another part of the same type of community and so we really couldn't talk to each other about something. So that was kind of fun. We just had fundamentally different thoughts about things. I mean, <laughs> me coming from defense, him coming from law enforcement. <laughs> so. no, I mean, anyway. that... Yeah, so if you want to talk to more people, I'm pretty sure I could dig them up. <laughs> Excellent, all right. That's great. And, that, and Thank that's, you. that's another part of the, you know, part of what emerged during the project was just I mean, just the difficulty of maintaining a family or a marriage uh, through through these careers. I mean, it, it, it's, it's it's something we probably don't need to tell you guys, but we were, I think we were both surprised to find the level of, of divorce, the, the level of broken families that we heard about. It was, it was all too much of a through line uh, through many of the conversations. Yeah, and, and you know, we're not psychoanalyzing these people that we're talking to, but we do see patterns in the ways people process right. things, like like the, the use of dark humor and, and a sort of, you know, uh, uh, common uh, uh, nonchalant downplaying of, of uh, or a sandwich rather, right? A sandwich of, 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 you know, innocuous, horribly terrifying and upsetting and innocuous and it's, and, and it's thrown out so fast that you don't have time to process it. The conversation just continues. And that, that's a pretty common, uh, I won't call it a tactic because I don't know if it's necessarily all that voluntary, but it's kind of a way that, that, that we've seen people deliver these very upsetting stories sometimes. Yes. I'd like to ask one of the questions relating to the idea of uh, humanizing actors specifically in the Portland issue. There has been at least some reporting that people who were asked to participate um, department, from the Department of Homeland Security didn't necessarily agree with the, didn't necessarily agree with the mission. Right. Now, a big question that may be, may be posed and might very well be profound for them is the question of choosing to do the job versus having to do the job. Mm -hmm. For sure, and that's exactly what we wanna to talk to people about. Um, and I, I, you know, we've, we've been lucky so far. Uh, I can't predict, uh, you know, whether people will want to talk to us about that or not, but what we're hearing is that it's not too likely that we're gonna get very far uh, right now, talking to people on the inside about uh, so what's it like to disagree fundamentally with what you're being asked to do? <laughs> Not only that, but then, and then how do you explain that to your, 
spouse? How do you explain that to your child? That, uh, that you're, how, yeah, how do you parse that kind of decision making for your family? Second question. It, 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 yeah, it is going on all, all throughout that department. I, I'm talking to a lot of folks at, at DHS right now, and, and, and every day it's, it's soul, they're soul searching. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, Chief. Is there also any concern, or have, have you noticed any concern in your interviews, it, particularly recently, about whether or not DHS will lose legitimacy in the greater body politic? If it does, then questions of whether it should exist, not exist, how it should be limited or not limited, those become major community issues. You know, it may very well cause a revisitation of things like the Patriot Act and all the things that you know, are can be fundamentally interesting but problematic. Yes. Yeah, I mean, in, in, a, in one of the more memorable ways in which this was described in one of the interviews was, was before the, the recent turn of events, but someone was just talking about how old DHS was, you know, and, and maybe during the interview, DHS was 16 or 17 years old. And he said, if, if this, was a, this was a person, they wouldn't even be old enough to have consensual sex yet. Uh, so, so, you know, how can we evaluate, you know, how, 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 how must we continue to make sense of the DHS and what kind of things are still going to need to be changed or need to continue to grow, evolve, what have you. But I, I think, I think you're right. It'd be interesting to ask people right now, uh, you, you might get a, a different kind of answer, but it, it might connect to that earlier answer as well. And, and sometimes I, I, uh, there, there's a there's a drift between all that I read about the agency and what actually comes out of conversations. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean that that sort of existential question of of you know is will DHS even exist uh, uh, and then what and then what you know in terms of job security where are all these folks going to be doing? They can't all work for Blackwater, or maybe they can. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you, you all know better than, than we do that uh, there's massive attrition and then there are folks who are trying to keep the train on the rails uh, uh, and, and, you know, only being so successful. So, so what can we do to help? What, what you started to talk about what, what are next steps? I, I'm, I'm, I'm really heartened by just what we're seeing in the chat and, you know, the offers of help there and, and, and what you're saying, Dean Griffin. I mean, that's all, that's, that's exactly what we're hoping for. And, and it's just, so how do we concretize that? And, uh, you know, we, we can make our contact information available and, uh, you know, just move forward in that way. I don't know if at some point it'd be good to have a, a, a sit down, uh, uh, you know, if we can ever actually sit down around a table together again. Uh, but uh, and I, you know, I love the idea of, of having a, having an initial, having an exhibit to put up some of these photographs with some text would be incredible. Uh, I'll, you know, let me, let me add my email to the, the thread here, but I'm also open to whatever would, whatever we can do to help grow the collaborations. Uh, you know, we're, we're available and, and eager. I mean, you, you can you can always order off menu, but the existing menu uh, includes uh, the book because it actually isn't quite complete. The proposal is complete, but we could still add interviews to the actual book project, uh, 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 exhibition project. But then we're talking about you know someone linked to uh, StoryCorps, and that's that's a great that's a great example because uh, that's. Uh, an example of a project that grew beyond the, the the initiators of the project and graduate students you know could be conducting these interviews you know we we established a kind of format seems to work pretty well people end up trusting us and and talking to us uh that kind of thing could be you know uh, uh distributed and done in a much more efficient way than just two people one on the camera one with a recorder uh you know one at a time you know picking through these interviews. Yeah, and another, I'm gonna send around a link to another organization that we've used as a model in terms of precisely that, using oral history as a teaching tool. 
is, is the voice of witness. I think I have the, uh, the URL right there, but I, it's called voice of witness. Uh, and it, it's, it's their methodology of how they translate oral history into a classroom tool, uh, into something that involves a whole community is, is something we're really angling for with both the museum exhibition and the, and the web presence we, we'd love to create. As I said, that's exactly what I thought. I think there's an education value to this, um, that if you can archive it and then um, maybe use it in a classroom or a demonstration as a case study right, for students to work on. Great. Sure, for sure. And Ed mentioned that, that we have also, he and I have, have team taught a couple of times now. Uh, and so, whereas the subject matter changes each time we team teach, the, the sort of uh, structural template uh, is now pretty tried and true. Um, so a team taught course in, in I don't know uh, how we would, what we would call this, but um, uh, uh, faces of Homeland Security. I don't know, so, uh, something could, could happen at the uh, uh, 400, 500 shared resource graduate, undergraduate level, or we've even done, uh, you know, we're doing a freshman seminar right now called Why Museums? Question uh, mark. So, I mean, you know, from the freshman level to, to the graduate level, uh, we could do teaching initiatives. Yeah. I mean, it's always been the hope of this project that it would, that it would serve people who are interested in the career. You know, that would, it would inform the general population about this growing field, but it would also be a way for people who are thinking about a career in Homeland Security to access information that maybe isn't available elsewhere that would be really helpful in understanding what you're stepping into. And that, that could come just from reading it, but it, it, even more it would come from doing some of the interviews uh, and being trained in how to do the interviews. And then those interviews would help grow the project, but also serve the individual doing the, we wouldn't just be making someone do work. Uh, I really believe that it would be something that would serve their own interests and their own future. One of the things, maybe this is out of turn, but one of the, one of the things that's come up more than once, talking to uh, veterans of the, the, the enterprise, um, prior to the emergence of Homeland Security as a growth industry, um, was that doing the job because it's a, a, a secure job is a terrible reason to do the job. And this is not my opinion. This is, this is the, the voices of some of the people we've talked to. There's like a sort of an esprit de corps kind of like, you know, credo of like believing in something larger than yourself, not going into it because it's like, oh, let's see, I could do nanotech. No, nah, that's not the thing anymore. Let's do that. Let's do Homeland Security. That's the thing now. Um, there are a lot of folks who think this, that's a bad idea. Um, and we all know that, you know, a freshman declares their major or imagines declaring their major uh, based on not that field, based on information that doesn't come from actually doing that thing. And then they get into forensics and they realize this isn't at all what I thought it was going to be. This is not fun. <laughs> this is, this is not like that show that I love at all. <laughs> um, that, that could be perhaps uh, not necessarily avoided, but certainly uh, made more realistic, right? So uh, VB asked about a documentary. Yeah, documentary is a great idea. Uh, not, not my wheelhouse, nor Ed's. I think, you know, we, we would want to collaborate with uh, my colleague, Sheila Curran-Bernard, or someone who actually does that kind of work. Um, no, I mean, I, you know, it, it's a weird fit. Uh, I, I mean, first of all, this is the first time I think I've ever really seriously taken pictures of human beings. <laughs> and so really the only way I can do it is, is to just like set them there like they're a thing and say, now don't move for about half an hour. <laughs> it's not, it's not, uh, it's not normal. It's not, it's not my thing. Um, so yeah, I think a documentarian, a journalist no one, would, would no do one a different would know work. that. From I mean, only because you say that. No one would know that if you didn't say it. Your, your photographs are incredibly accomplished, but you know Oh, that. shucks. <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, I don't know how, I've never done a CEHC brown bag before. I don't know how, I mean, I know it's one o'clock, 
Uh, I don't know how you guys usually roll, but uh, oh, you even have a look at that. I got my bag. Oh, we usually open a couple of bottles of alcohol right now because we're so damn depressed <laughs> after our brown bags. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we don't. Most of our brown bags are perfect. <laughs> it's a great crew. If they're you know cognizant of people's time, if there's any other questions. Um, yeah, we're at an hour now. Yeah, you know something I'll also offer to to Danny and Ed. Um, you know, it, 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 it's not too early for, for you to to get into e-tech and start to take a look at the space too. Um, so, so that's something I, I absolutely um, w w would offer. And, you know, I, I, I see the chief here and, and I know Terry Mertz is here and I, I saw Stein, James Steiner. Um, we, we've got folks here that, that can start to connect you, um, probably provide you with, with more context than, than you could ever possibly need. Wonderful. Wonderful. Great. I'd love to haul the big camera over uh, and, and see the drone lab and see uh, everything else that's happening. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for this. Of all course. Right. Yeah. Everybody be well and have a, have a good day. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Until uh, the next time. Yes. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye now.